Hey, welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, healing hearts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Pastor John Mark. I'm so excited that you've connected to our page today. Be sure to grab a notebook, a pen, a paper, your phone, however you want to take notes and get ready for today's message. Hey, hey, hey. Merry Christmas. One week away. We ready for it? Got your Christmas gifts all ready under the tree? No? Last minute shoppers? Yo, it's crazy out on them streets trying to shop right now. So get that stuff done. Get your Amazon gifts ordered up. Uh, really, I want to encourage you, Christmas Eve, come on out to the production. It's going to be great. Saturday night and Sunday morning, both services. The kids have been working really hard. It's called Straight Out of Bethlehem. And in the spirit of the title of the play coming up, I want to do a sermon today called Straight Out of Dot Dot Dot. How to get out of situations in your life, how to overcome things, how to change the environment in which you live in. Last week we talked about the fact that we all need a savior and being saved is great, but just because you're rescued out of something or out of eternal damnation and you have salvation does not mean that you have found personal freedom yet. You didn't get saved and then all of a sudden you lost 35 pounds. Correct? You didn't get saved and then all of a sudden all of your problems went away. You didn't get saved and then all of a sudden you forgot what you went through as a child. Right? There are things that we still need to do in and of ourselves, although we have freedom in Christ or salvation, we've got to work on some stuff within us because life is complex and it's ever-changing, it's filled with challenges and trials and tribulations. However, we are not called to be defeated by these obstacles, but rather to overcome them. I want to look at something today. Galatians 5.1 tells us this. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Therefore, stand firm then, stand in that freedom, and do not let yourselves become burdened again by a yoke of bondage. That's your personal responsibility, to do not let yourself be bound up again. Christ gave you the power to be free. Be free. Stand firm in that freedom. And do not let yourself be wrapped up again in a yoke of bondage. Let's open in prayer. Father, we thank you today as we get into your word. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you would open the eyes of our understanding Enlighten us to your truth. Speak to our hearts. Let us be open-minded to the ideas presented today in Jesus' name. Amen. As I was sitting down and thinking about the idea of freedom, emotional freedom, uh, psychological freedom, spiritual freedom, I wrote this quote, and it says this. Freedom is not deliverance from external oppression. It is deliverance from internal damnation. It would be so great that by you getting saved or finding spiritual freedom that it changed everybody else. It would be so great that you get saved and your job changes and your overbearing boss changes. But that's not what happens. Freedom isn't everybody else changing. Freedom is you changing. Freedom is something that you decide to live and be inside of yourself every single day. Last week we spoke about the fact that we need a savior. We all need rescuing and that's why Jesus came. Yet, there's another level to the human condition. We all want freedom. And many of us assume that Christianity is this magic get out of jail free card and all of your problems go away. But that's not what we have been promised in scripture. We, did not, we were not promised in scripture that because we become Christians or we give our lives to Christ, every single problem goes away. What we have been promised, however, is that we've been given the strength and the power and the ability to get through problems when they come in our life. That we can make it through, that we can uh, walk through the valley of the shadow of death and fear no evil. It is possible to walk through the valley of the shadow of death, to have scary things happening around you, and it not harm you. One day, I was asked to do a wedding down in Jersey City. We were driving down the highway. And all of a sudden, I don't know what happened, but the cars all around us just started smashing into each other. 
and we were driving in my wife's brand new, uh, she, has, she drives a Jeep Wrangler, brand new Jeep Wrangler, it was like a couple weeks old, and all of a sudden the cars just start smashing into the wall, like the, the medium inside, like bam, bam, and I'm like, Jesus, and I slam on the brakes, and I like never, dude, cars all around us, smashed up, nothing hit us, nothing hit us. Now, I am normally a good Samaritan. Normally, I take out my chaplain's badge, I put it on, and I'm going to handle the situation. But we were already running late for this wedding. So I put the car in reverse, backed up, and said, in the name of Jesus, and just kept going. But, like, things were happening all around us, and it didn't touch us. Now, again, I'm not trying to over-spiritualize it. I'm not saying just because I said the name of Jesus, our car didn't get in a wreck. Like, it's just amazing. And I'm going to give God glory for that, right? Life can be going crazy all around you, and it doesn't mean it has to affect you. It doesn't have to affect you. You are in control of what happens on the inside of you. What we are promised is, although we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we do not have to fear evil. Why? Say it with me. Do you guys know the verse? Because thou art with me. I don't have to fear the dangers that are happening during the day or the toils at night because thou art with me. We are to have freedom internally even when experiencing hardship externally. I'm going to give you guys a statement today, an idea that my children hate They've asked me never to say it because it really bothers them. But I'm going to teach it to you today. And you can decide what you want to do with it. But here's the idea. No one can make you feel anything. No one can make you feel anything. So, you know, my kids would come, I, that person just pissed me off so bad at school today. And I'd say to my kids, you understand that no one has the ability to piss you off. No one has that ability. You are choosing anger. You are choosing to respond to a stimulus with anger. But no one has the power to make you feel anything. Yes, I do. They were just pushing my buttons. And they know what, no, 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 no. We don't have buttons. You may have something on your clothes called a button, but you do not have an emotional button. That's all made up. That's all lack of emotional discipline. That's, that, listen, no one's words can make you feel anything. Words have no definition except the ones that you create. You create the definitions of words that people speak to you. Now, listen, you may sit, be sitting there today so mad at me right now. You're pissed off right now because I said that. Right? The truth of the matter is I'm a control freak. I am a control freak. And I don't like anybody having power over me. That's why I was good at wrestling, right? I didn't want anybody to beat me at wrestling. You're not going to be stronger than me. I'm going to cheat to win when it comes to wrestling, right? I'm going to grab parts of your body that shouldn't be grabbed just to win a wrestling match. You get what I'm saying? But I, was, I, I had that same victim mentality that a lot of people have. I'm angry because you said something. And when I realized that I actually had the power to control my own emotions, I have the, like, you don't have the power over me to put me in a bad mood. Getting into a bad mood was your choice. You chose to be in a bad mood. And you have a choice to not be in a bad mood. That is your choice. This is what the Bible is talking to us about. Do not let yourself be in a bad mood. Do not let yourself be enslaved again to anger. You don't have to be angry. I mean, wouldn't it be great though, like, we could fix everybody else? We could, we could fix people from saying dumb stuff that make us angry? But I got that revelation one time when I was driving. Someone cut me off on the highway and I got really mad, right? And I'm not going to say that I said any bad words or that I gave them a hand gesture. I'm not going to say I did any of that, but I got angry. And then I thought to myself, how did them cutting me off have the power to put me in a bad mood? They didn't hit my car. We didn't have an accident. Nothing about what they did should have made me angry. I chose to be angry over a vehicle. I, I, was, I would get angry over someone tailgating me. Just go around me. 
How, how did them putting their car close to my bumper put me in a bad mood? What I literally was doing was giving them control over my emotions. I was giving them control over my emotions. Come on, somebody. No one has that power. Okay? So here's a popular passage. It's in the book of 2 Timothy 4, 5. 2 Timothy is a book of the Bible that the apostle Paul wrote to his protege or his son in the faith, Timothy. Timothy was in charge of running the church at Ephesus, a Greco-Roman area. And Paul was trying to give him some leadership advice. How do you run this church and get it in order and, and run it in a way that's life-giving to you? And he says this to him, he goes, but you, son, keep your head in all things. Keep your head in all situations. Keep your head. Don't get all crazy. Don't get all upset. Don't get all depressed. Don't get all emotional. Endure hardship through the work of an evangelist Discharge the duties of your ministry. Now, endure hardship doesn't mean go find hard things to solve. He's not saying go out and create problems. He's saying that hardship is going to come, but endure it. Handle it. Get through it. Figure out systems and processes and ways that you can work through the hard times of the ministry. So I want to show you a story today in the Old Testament where God shows up and rescues and delivers his people, but he doesn't do it in a way that we would like. We would love to like pray, we see a problem coming, pray, and God just stop the problem. God just take it away, I don't wanna go through this. But a lot of times God doesn't rescue you out of a situation, he empowers you to get through the situation. Come on. Check this out. This is a long story, so read it with me. It'll be on the screen. Daniel 3, verse 8. At this time, some astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews, and they said to, the king, ne to king Nebuchadnezzar, what's his name? Nebuchadnezzar. May the king live forever. Your majesty has issued a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, the pipe, and all kinds of music must fall down and worship the image of gold. How many of you guys want to do that? Wants to get like a statue of Mary and we all bow down to it? Okay. A little, little bit of shade there. Verse 11. And that whoever does not fall down into worship will be thrown in the blazing furnace. But king, there are some Jews whom you've set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, your majesty. Oh man, they just hit his pride. Right? They just fed his ego. Neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold that you've set up. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men, were, these men were brought before the king and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? I'm going to give you another chance. I'm going to give you a chance to do what I want you to do. I'm going to give you another chance to back down from the decision that you've made. Now, when you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, the pipe, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the idol I have made, then very good. It will be all well. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hands? Oh, man. Ego trip. Power struggle right here, right? I'm going to tell you this. Anytime you want to make a decision that's not popular, you're always going to have to be faced with this right before you do it. Last chance. You could back out now. You really sure you want to make an unpopular decision? Are you really sure that you don't want to go with what everyone else is doing? You sure? I'm going to give you one last chance. Verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hands. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. Now, it would be awesome if God just killed Nebuchadnezzar right there. Right? Wouldn't that be awesome? I mean, is that really what we all want? God, just like, shut this guy up. God, just stop them. Because it's everybody else's problem. This is his problem, God, not ours. Why are we being persecuted? Because of someone else's stupidity. 
Why am I feeling the pain of this? Because other people, just stop it, God. Come on. No? Just me. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was furious with them, and his attitude toward them changed. He ordered the furnace to be heated seven times hotter. How much? Seven times hotter than usual. And commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. And I'm going to tell you why he got the strongest men. is because Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were strong dudes. They were like the elite soldiers in this regime. They, 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 if you go back and read the story about them as they're being trained and stuff, they would not eat the food that was presented to the king's table, but they had their own food according to their own law. And they were, still, they were the strongest, most talented, most intelligent so in order to like kind of control them, he's like, get the strongest guys. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace was so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took them up. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, certainly, your majesty. He said, look. I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looked like a son of the gods. So, like, here's part of my problem with this. They still had to get thrown in a fire. Right? He didn't deliver them from being thrown in a fire. They're still in it. They're still walking through the fire. They're still walking through the tribulation. Yet, thou art with me. Right? The image of Christ shows up hundreds of years before he's supposed to. An angel of the Lord appears with them in the midst of the problem, in the midst of the fire to deliver them. They still went through it, but they were not harmed. They were not touched. That's the life in Christ that we are promised. Watch this. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire. And the satraps and the prefects, governors and royal advisors crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair on their head singed. Their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. Dude, that's like impossible. You ever been around a bonfire for like two seconds? You go by a bonfire for two seconds, everybody knows you were by a bonfire, right? And nothing, they didn't even smell like smoke. In the middle of a problem, it didn't even get on them. Isn't it weird how like a bad attitude's contagious? A a neurotic personality? Isn't it weird how like swear words are contagious? Right, you could be so good, not swear for a long time, go hang out with somebody for like a week who like cusses and all of a sudden you're cussing again, right? It gets on you. It can, it can get on you, right? The smoke, the smell didn't even get on them. Listen, I, I, I like fire. I'm not a pyromaniac, but I do like fires. I like starting fires and all that kind of stuff. So one time we had a house that needed some area cleared, and I'm cutting down trees and I'm burning it. And I got a really big bonfire going. And I started to get lazy. Like, I didn't want to cut the tree down and cut it up and throw each log on the fire. I was like, you know what? I got this big tractor. I'm just going to start pushing trees over into the fire and just let them burn whole. It was a genius idea. (laughs) So I took the bucket of my tractor. I put it up on this pine tree. Pine trees don't have very deep roots, but they have, like, wide roots. And I didn't really think about this. So as I pushed the tree over with my tractor, the root system came up underneath the tractor and picked it up in the air. So now my tractor's in the air. I can't move forward. I can't put, move back. Even if I push the bucket down, I can't get the tractor off. The tree is in the fire, big fire. The tree is on fire, and the fire is moving towards my tractor. And I'm like, oh, my God. So I panic. I run back up to the house. I get my chainsaw, start it up, and I start, I'm like in between the bucket of my tractor and the bonfire. I'm only like three feet away, and I'm trying to cut this tree. Literally, the hair on the side of my head, when I had hair, was all like singeing. My sunglasses are melting, like my shirt is like burning, it, and I'm, I'm three feet away. I'm not even in the middle of this fire, right? These guys walked through fire, and they didn't even get singy hair. Has anybody ever lit a propane barbecue grill, and it just poof, like that? One time, like the igniter broke on my grill, 
I was like, oh, I got matches inside. Never thinking that I left it on. Went inside, got the matches, and I'm like, oh, I'm going to light this. And I went like this. Soup. Boom. <laughs> Woo. Lost my eyelashes, my eyebrows. The situation. They come out not even smelling like fire. Verse 28. Then King Nebuchadnezzar said, praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him, defied the king's command, and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. It would have been so easy for these three guys to be like, God, why? Like, we're doing everything you asked us. Why are you allowing this? That was never their heartbeat. They did not choose to be victims. They did not choose a victim mentality. They chose to overcome. They chose to be free even though they were being persecuted. Wow. Wow. If you want to read anything about this, if you have, if you have a tendency to uh, blame everybody else for what you're going through, uh, study a guy named Viktor Frankl. Viktor Frankl, he's a great leadership, uh, personal help, kind of internal person. He wrote this quote in one of his books. Uh, uh, Man's Search for Meaning is the name of the book by Viktor Frankl. He said this, everything can be taken from a man but one thing, the last of the human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. Man, you choose what you're feeling. You choose the attitude that's inside of you, even in the midst of a bad situation. Listen, man, the Bible tells us this, and this can fix many of your marriage problems. A soft answer turns away wrath. Now, let me explain this verse to you. A soft answer doesn't turn away their wrath. Things in scripture are never about the way that you behave in order to fix somebody else. A soft answer within you turns away the wrath in you. Turns away the wrath in you. This is all an internal fix, right? It's an internal process. We're saved, we're sanctified, we're set apart spiritually. But we do need to work on our emotions on the inside and it will manifest to the outside. The internal power of God and the faith that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego possessed was so strong that it not only sustained them through the fire, but it changed the nation. It changed the king's heart. Not because they prayed for the king's heart to change, but because they had the right heart. And the right heart can be contagious. So listen, maybe the smoke and the fire and the smell didn't get on them, but their internal peace got on the king. In the midst of their struggle, they still had joy, they still had peace, they still had faith. And in one translation, it said that they were dancing in the fire. They were moving about dancing in the fire. I, I love that image. Like we can dance and have joy even in the middle of some of the hardest situations in our life. I love the fact that Jesus didn't always rescue everybody. There's a story in the Bible where his disciples are in a boat and they're going to the other side of the, of the lake or the, or the sea or whatever it is and a storm comes in. And the, and the boat's getting beat and it's getting smashed and the disciples are bugging out. And Jesus didn't save them. He didn't stop it. What's he doing? Sleeping. Sleeping. They go wake him up and now he's a little annoyed. He's like, what are you waking me up for? They're like, man, look, don't you feel the storm? He's like, yeah, it rocked me to sleep. Like, no, come on, like, we're going to die. And he puts up his hands, he says, peace be still. He calmed the wind and the waves. And he looks at the disciples and he's like, you have little faith. And, and I've heard it preached, right? I've heard it preached by faith preachers like, see, guys, we got to be able to talk to the wind and the waves. we got to command the storms to go away. We're going to blow COVID away. And that was not... That was not the point to this. It, it, the point wasn't that they didn't have faith to calm the wind and the waves. They didn't know they could. It was the first time they saw that miracle. 
What he was saying was, you guys forgot who was in your boat. Yea, though you walk to the valley of the shadow of death, you can have no fear, for I am with you. The boat's not going to sink with Jesus in it. The boat's not going to sink with Jesus in it, right? And sometimes it's easy for us to think that our lives are sinking. And our lives are under pressure and under attack. We've got to put our eyes on Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. So I want to pose a question today. What sort of things do you need to get straight out of? What things do you have to need to get straight out of? Maybe some of you need to get straight out of doubt. Got to get doubt out of your life, straight out of it. Maybe some of us need to get straight out of insecurity. Insecure. If you have trouble making decisions, it's because you lack a certain level of confidence. Ooh, I know, I know, that's, that's tough, right? I'm confident, but, but, but you're worried about making decisions. But wonder if it hurts somebody's feelings, wonder if it's not the right decision, wonder if it doesn't work out. Well, have confidence, right? And, and here's, he, people ask me all the time, how do you start things and new projects and new agendas? Like, how do you know that you're supposed to do that? And nine times out of ten, I don't know I'm supposed to do it. I say, what's the worst thing that happens? We fail? You can't be afraid of failure. You're going to fail when you're inventing something. Could you imagine Thomas Edison giving up on his inventions that didn't work the first time? He said, I never failed at creating a light bulb. I just figured out ways that didn't work. That's part of the process of life. But when you lack confidence, you don't step out in faith, man. Trying to help somebody today. Maybe someone in here today needs to get straight out of anger. Anger has been ruining your relationships. You've been using your anger to control other people around you. Now listen, I'm just talking to you today because that was me. That was me. I was really good at just blowing up and shutting people down. And the louder I got, they just submit and do what I said. And it was ruining relationships. People didn't want to be around me because they loved me. They felt like they had to be around me because they feared me. That's not love. And that's not the model that God gave us. If you've ever been raised in a religious church that made you keep coming back because you were afraid of God's anger, that's not, that's not what God ever wanted. For God so loved the world. Not God was so angry at everybody that he gave his son. For God so loved the world that he gave his son. That whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. It was based on love, not anger, not control. So maybe we could get straight out of anger this year. Stop, stop blaming everybody else for, for pushing your buttons and making you, they can't do that. You can control your responses. And uh, there's this another book that I read, I forget the title of it off the top of my head. Um, what Got You Here Won't Get You There was the name of the book. What Got You Here in Leadership Won't Get You There. And the book said this. That if you want to change something about your life, let's say that you want to be more joyful, stop trying to figure out all the things that you have to start doing in order to be joyful. Just think about all the things, just the one or two things you have to stop doing in order to be joyful, right? So in order for me to be joyful, all I have to stop doing is, be angry, is being angry. Stop being angry. Stop it. Well, you don't understand. No, you, you don't understand. You, you don't understand the power that God has given you. And that's what this is. For, for freedom, Christ has set you free. We do not have to be enslaved with the yoke of anger. We can stop being angry and allow the Holy Spirit to do his perfect work. I want to tell you this one. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And I know that we like to think about that. Yeah, greater is he is in me than everybody else in this room. That's, it wasn't about people. The spirit that is in you is greater than the spirit that's in the world. Right? So sin, Satan, sickness, disease has no power over you because the greater one lives on the inside of you. Nelson Mandela once said this, For to be free is not merely to cast off one's chains, but to live in a way that respects and enhances the freedoms of others. 
Wow. See, now that's the next step. Maybe you have found freedom, but are you empowering others in their freedom? Are you empowering other people to have freedom as well? Or is it like, no, I'm free, but you need to change. You need to fix this. You need to stop doing this kind of sin. Man, like, eyes on your own paper. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Live a life that is exemplary, and that becomes contagious. Love is contagious. A good attitude is contagious. Everybody wants to be around the fun life of the party person. Nobody wants to be around the angry drunk. Come on. You know when you got that one family member, they come to family dinner, and there's angry all the time. Everyone's like, Ugh. Can you go watch Christmas Story by yourself? We're going to go play Monopoly. Right? I believe this is a timely message for us today. That freedom is not circumstantial, but freedom is a choice. It's a choice that you make every day to be free within yourself. And I'm just feeling something today. This service is a little bit different than last. Maybe this holiday season, you need to free yourself and free somebody else by forgiving them. By forgiving them. We think sometimes like, well, I'm never gonna forgive them. And we think by not forgiving them, we're hurting them. But by not forgiving someone, you're actually hurting yourself. The Bible says that bitterness is as rotten as is to the bone. If you break that down and study it out, it says this, that bitterness and unforgiveness is cancerous to your body. Cancerous to your body. Bitterness and anger is stress on your body. It will raise your blood pressure, increase your heart rate. It will take years off your life living in bitterness. Maybe this holiday season, without even the person saying sorry, you can free them and free yourself by forgiving someone who's wronged you, forgiving someone who's hurt you. It was 30 years ago. Yeah, it was 30 years ago. They don't even remember. But you're holding on to something. You're holding on to a grudge. Maybe you need to get straight out of that. Be free from that and live the life that God has placed before you. Father, we come to the name of Jesus. Lord, we worship you today. We worship you, we, 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 we request that you renew the, jo re the joy of our salvation and renew our right spirit within us. Help us to operate in the joy of the Lord. Let it be our strength. Lord, let a merry heart do good like a medicine in our lives. Help us to appreciate this life that we have and the family and friends that we have around us in this holiday season. Let it, let it be light. Let it be fun. I pray, God, that as we get together throughout these next couple weeks with family and friends, that we have moments of belly laughs, great times. Build us up. Strengthen us. Lord, I pray today that your spirit be known to us, that the peace of God that transcends time and space and our mental faculties would just reign in our lives. Let the peace of God be in our homes. I pray for the restoration in our homes and restoration in relationships and restoration of finances in the name of Jesus. Lead us, Holy Spirit, through the rest of this year. Help us to finish strong, placing you first in our lives. As we leave here today, Lord, I thank you that we are blessed. We're blessed coming in, we're blessed going out. Everything we set our hands to will prosper and be successful in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for watching today's message. My name is Pastor John Mark. And if this message has made an impact in your life in any way, I'd like to ask you to do a couple of things. We want you to like and subscribe to our channel and join us right here every Sunday at 9.30 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. The next thing I'm going to ask you to do is to take your next step in your journey. We'd love to help you do that. And you can head over to FamilyChurchNY.com or email us at team at FamilyChurchNY.com to get started.